Good morning. Going to give people a minute to join us today. All right, gonna give people about another 30 seconds and then we will start today's lecture. All right, it's gonna be a small class today. <laughs> Let's do a little screen share, event sharing options, one second. Only host can share. Okay, so let's start off with a little recap. So this chapter is all about reflection and refraction. Remember that any time that light hits a surface, let me change this color here, draw, let's do green. Three possibilities for what can happen. One, that light can get absorbed. Two, that light can get reflected. Three, that light can get transmitted through. Kind of talked a little bit about how light gets transmitted by constantly getting absorbed and then re-emitted. What we didn't talk about that we'll talk about today is that when light goes from one transparent material to another, it can bend. And we call the bending of light refraction. But let's first just talk about reflection. So anytime light hits a surface and it gets reflected, if I want to know how that light is going to get reflected, simple law called the law of reflection. And it just says this, whatever angle light hits at, which we call the angle of incidence, the angle that it reflects at, the angle of reflection will be exactly the same. But we always measure angles with respect to something called the normal, which is a line drawn perpendicular to the surface at the point where it hits. Just doing a little new share for a second. Uh, I'll do that one. Okay, so like, let's say, so one, this is showing that I've got light hitting here. Some of that light is getting reflected and also some of it is getting transmitted through. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The normal is always a line which is drawn perpendicular to the point where the light hits. And what the law of reflection says, if I line this up, is that the angle of incidence which in this case would be this angle between the light and the normal force or the normal is going to be equal to the angle of reflection. So like right now, this angle is about 64, 65 degrees. So if that's the angle it hits at, that's going to be the angle it reflects at. If the angle changes, so like right now it's hitting at about a 30 degree angle, that's also going to be the angle that it reflects at. So that's just simply called the law of reflection. So going back, the way our eyes work is that our eye, our brain, cannot tell the difference between reflected light and light that's just coming from an actual source. So what our brain does is it always assumes light traveled in a straight line and pretty much takes the light rays that you see reflected off a surface, in this case a mirror, and your brain traces them back. So, you know, you have an object here, like a light bulb or a candle, it's emitting light in all directions. Only some of that light is going to reflect off the mirror and hit our eye. So if we are over here somewhere, here's our eye. We see these reflected light rays coming from the mirror. And, you know, maybe there's another one over here. What your brain does without you even realizing it is it sort of traces those light rays back your brain sees an image where it looks like the light rays originated from. So all of these light rays reflecting off the mirror look as if they came from a real object behind the mirror. This is where your brain would see the image. So the reason you see your image in a plain mirror is, in this case, if you're looking in the bathroom mirror, you're not emitting your own light. You're reflecting light from a light source. Some of that light hits the mirror, 
reflects off and then you see the reflected light into your brain it looks like that light came from a point behind the mirror okay a uh, couple other things let's keep going one we talked a little bit about what's called specular and diffuse reflection specular reflection is reflection from a smooth surface and in specular reflection all the light is going to reflect in the same direction this is not good for seeing objects if we had specular reflection taking place all the time you would only be able to see objects from a very specific location so you know if this was a light source over here this could be a light bulb or something like this and i wanted to see this piece of paper or whatever this is I could only have my eyes in this location and that's the only spot I'd be able to see it. If I was somewhere over here or somewhere over here, I wouldn't see it. Not ideal. Luckily, most objects at the atomic level are not completely smooth. They're rough. And we call reflection from a rough surface diffuse reflection. So again, if this was our light source over here, and this was something we were trying to see like a piece of paper since it's rough the light is going to reflect in many different directions which means i could be over here and see the object i could be over here i could be over here almost everything we see every day is because of diffuse reflection and then the last thing i started talking about was refraction so one refraction is simply when light passes from one transparent material to another that light can bend meaning it's not moving in a straight line once it goes from let's say air to water or glass to air that light can bend and the way we figure out how light is going to bend is we sort of use this analogy of if i had cartwheels and the cartwheels were sliding from one surface to another so in this case going from sidewalk to grass if one cartwheel hits the grass before the other in this case the cartwheels that hits the grass is going to slow down first while the cartwheel that's still in the sidewalk is going to be moving faster when that happens it's going to cause the cartwheel to pivot almost as if you had a shopping cart where one of the wheels didn't spin right it's always going to turn around that slower wheel so when it goes from sidewalk to grass it's going to bend well light behaves in the same way if i were to take let's say a ray of light here and i imagine these two cartwheels that are sort of moving along the same direction if this cartwheel is hitting the water first where the speed of light is less than an air this cartwheel is going to slow down first while this one is still in the air where it's traveling faster so it's going to cause it to bend and let me just show you a little animation so this is, can I write on this? I can't write on this, but let's say here's a beam of light in air, and this might be a thing of glass. What's gonna happen is that light, if it travels in a straight line, would go something like this, but it bends in going from air to glass, and then it bends again in going from glass to air. And what you wanna think about is, let's just do this for a second. Pause. So here, this side is hitting the glass first. So this side is gonna slow down, while this side over here, which is still in the air, is still gonna be moving at that same speed it had before, which is gonna cause it to pivot. And now, once this thing gets here, this bottom part is now gonna hit the air first, making it go faster. So what you're gonna see is this will bend again. So this will sort of let you know which direction light is going to bend and going from one transparent material to another. So going back, kind of did a little exercise. And one thing about this, I kind of mentioned, objects in water are always deeper than they appear because of refraction. So if you're gonna see something, light from the object has to get to your eye. So in this case, if you look, chest obviously is not emitting its own light but it's reflecting some sunlight in the water the light as it goes from water to air is going to bend so these light rays coming up like this are going to bend in this direction but your brain always assumes that light traveled in a straight line 
So if you see these two light rays from you, it's going to appear as if it came from a point right here. That's where you see the image. So anytime you see an object in water, it's always deeper than it appears because the light bends in going from water to air. And I think that was the last thing in terms of a recap. So before I move on with new material, are there any questions I can answer about anything I covered on Tuesday? Going once, going twice. All right, recap coming off. Last things we're gonna talk about are dispersion, rainbows, and total internal reflection. Okay. So, actually, let me just show you this uh, PowerPoint. Let's scroll down for a second. Okay. So, one, how does light get through a transparent material? By constantly getting absorbed and re emitted, absorbed and re emitted, absorbed and re emitted. Because of this, the speed of light in a material is different than the speed of light in a vacuum. Speed of light in the atmosphere is different than the speed of light in a vacuum. Well, it ends up that different frequencies of light will get absorbed and re emitted different amounts in different materials. The big picture is the speed of light in a transparent material depends upon the frequency of the light and obviously the type of material. But red light in glass will travel at a different speed than blue light in glass, which will travel at a different speed than violet light. Well, how much light bends in going from one transparent material to another depends upon the speed of light in the material. So if different frequencies travel at different speeds, that means they're going to get bent or refracted by different amounts. And you probably have seen a prism before. All a prism is, is just a glass, a piece of glass. Usually it's in a triangular shape, it doesn't have to be. And what a prism will do is it'll take white light and it'll disperse it into the different frequencies because the different frequencies will travel at different speeds and be bent by different amounts. So like here is, this might be just red light coming in. If I just had red light coming in, it's going to bend once and going from air to glass, bend again and going from glass to air. Well, if instead I have white light, remember white light is really all frequencies added together. So I've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Well, red travels at a different speed than yellow, which travels at a different speed than blue, which travels at a different speed than violet, and so on. Which means once white light goes from air to glass, red is going to get bent by a different amount than yellow, and so on and so forth. And then when it goes from glass to air, again, they're going to get refracted. So the end result is you send white light into a prism and that white light is going to get bent once and going from air to glass again and going from glass to air. But the different frequencies are gonna get bent by different amounts. So what we call dispersion is really just separating white light into different colors according to the frequency because the different frequencies will get bent by different amounts. Uh, let me see if I can show you this. Uh, do, 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 new share. Uh, let's go to prisms. Okay, so here is just a, let's get rid of the normal for a second. So this might just be a beam of, let's just call it blue light. The blue light is gonna come in and it's gonna hit the glass and it's gonna bend in going from air to glass. And then it's gonna bend again in going from glass to air. So this is just a single frequency of light. And one, you can see that if instead of blue light, I use red light, it's going to get bent by slightly different amounts. Well, if instead I send white light in, 
White light consists of light of all frequencies added together. It's a little bit hard to see, but can I move this a bit? Move this. The white light bends in going from air to glass, and it doesn't show it inside here, but the different frequencies get bent by different amounts. And then it bends again in going from glass to air, and the different frequencies are going to get bent by different amounts. Violet is going to get bent the least. Red is going to get bent. I'm sorry, violet's going to get bent the most. Red's going to get bent the least. Okay, so going back, what I want to talk about is rainbows. Very cool. So rainbows are the result of dispersion, but rather than being dispersed by a prism, it's dispersed by water droplets. And all a rainbow is, is sunlight that enters a raindrop and gets refracted and reflected a couple times and then eventually leads the water droplet. So here's what happened. I've got a water droplet right here and I've got sunlight. And sunlight is white light, right? It's all colors mixed together. That sunlight is gonna hit the rainbow and what's not shown here is some of the light is going to get reflected, <clears throat> right? Anytime light hits a surface, some of it can get absorbed, some of it can get reflected, some of it can get transmitted through. We're only looking at the light which causes rainbows. So sunlight comes in, some of this light gets reflected, but the light that does enter the water droplet is going to get dispersed because of refraction. Red is going to get bent the least, violet's going to get bent the most. Then it hits the back of the water droplet. Now, some of this is going to actually leave, but that's not the light that causes the rainbow. The light that causes the rainbow is the light that gets reflected off the back of the water droplet, comes towards the front, and then it bends again in leaving the water droplet and going to the air. So most rainbows are caused by light from the sun going through a water droplet, it refracts, let me just erase this for once. It refracts once when it enters the water droplet. It reflects off the back of the water droplet. And then it refracts again when it's leaving the water droplet. And then if you are over here, I'll go through this in a second, but it's kind of interesting. From each water droplet, your eye is only going to be in the position to see one color from each droplet of water. So for example, if my eye was right here, the violet would hit my eye, but the other colors would not enter my eye. So for this particular water droplet, I would only see violet. So kind of going through this, you've got incoming light enters the water droplet and different frequencies are bent by different amounts. So that's right up here. And again, light is going to get reflected, but that's not the light that causes the rainbow. Then the refracted light hits the back of the water droplet. Some of it is transmitted into the air, but that's not what causes the rainbow. What causes the rainbow is the water that gets reflected back into the water droplet. So that's right here reflecting off the side. Then this reflected light then gets bent again as it's leaving the water droplet. So the rainbows that we see are the result of refraction twice and reflection once inside a water droplet. It refracts once when entering the droplet, it reflects off the back, and then it refracts again in leaving the droplet. So the different colors of a rainbow is just the result of dispersion of sunlight but by millions and millions and millions of teeny tiny water droplets that are acting like little prisms. And again, if this is just two water droplets of many, my eye is only gonna be in the right position to see one color from each water droplet. Now each water droplet is dispersing the entire rainbow. So all shown here is just red and violet but you've got the entire rainbows of colors being dispersed from each rainbow or from each water droplet. But this water droplet, the only color that enters my eye is red. 
So I'm only going to see red from this particular water droplet. From this water droplet, the only color that reaches my eye is violet. So from each water droplet, you were only seeing one color. But you've got millions and billions of water droplets all dispersing the entire spectrum. And so what you end up seeing is you see the entire rainbow of colors because you're seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of water droplets dispersing an entire spectrum. But from each color, from each droplet, you're only going to see one. So again, if this is one droplet, a woman standing in this position is only going to see red from this droplet. For this droplet, she's only going to see violet. <clears throat> this has an interesting <clears throat> consequence. No two people ever see the exact same rainbow. Nobody has ever seen the exact same rainbow that you're seeing. Even if you have two people standing side by side. So let's say there's another person here. Oh, that person is not a good person. So you've got a, <laughs> my artistic abilities are not great. So I've got another person standing right here. That person's still gonna see the same kind of rainbow in terms of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But the colors that produce the rainbow for one person are gonna be produced by different water droplets than a rainbow seen by somebody else, even if they're just a couple inches away. Which means that every single rainbow ever is only for you. <sighs> nature's creating a rainbow just for you. So if you wanted to see the same rainbow somebody else was seeing, you would actually have to put your eyes in the exact same location that their eyes were. And even then, it wouldn't be the same rainbow because the water droplets that produced the rainbow that they saw have continued falling, and now different droplets are producing a rainbow that you would see, even if you're in the exact same position as they are. Kind of cool. One other interesting thing, <clears throat> rainbows are actually complete circles, meaning the sunlight from the sun, once it enters the water droplets, they're actually dispersing a rainbow that's a full 360 degrees. It's just that the ground cuts off the bottom portion of the rainbow. But if you've ever been in a plane, sometimes in a plane you can see a full 360 degree rainbow I don't know how well you can see it here, but you've got a full circular rainbow right here. And I would have liked to have done this in class. You can also do this in lab. So you can't see it, but there's a very bright light source down here shining through just a circle of water, just a sphere of water. And that water is acting just like a water droplet and it's producing a rainbow 360 degree. Okay, now. Let me just show you real quick. You have probably seen double rainbows before. So here's just a couple of nice pictures of a double rainbow. So here you've got your primary rainbow and here you've got the secondary rainbow. You've got primary rainbow right here, secondary rainbow and so on. How do secondary rainbows get produced? And the answer is this. If I have sunlight entering the top of a water droplet. Again, what happens is it refracts once in entering the water droplet, it reflects off the back of the droplet, and then it refracts again in leaving the water droplet. This is what produces a single rainbow, is one reflection of the light from the back of the water droplet. Now, if instead sunlight enters the bottom of the water droplet, then what can happen is I have it refracts once when entering the water droplet, but then it reflects from the back of the water droplet. And just because of the whole, how the angles work and angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, this reflected light is not reflected enough to, enter, to leave the water droplet, but it reflects again off the top of the droplet, and then it refracts when leaving. So a double rainbow, 
is produced by two reflections inside the water droplet. And that happens when sunlight enters the bottom of the droplet, refracts, reflects, reflects, refracts. Whereas most rainbows are produced by light entering the top of the water droplet, it refracts once, only reflects once, refracts again, and then leaves. Uh, let me see if I can just show you one more time. New share, let's go back to, okay. So instead of a, let's kind of do a water droplet. Let's see if I can show you this. So if I have light entering the top of the water droplet, so one, can we do reflections? Okay, so the light that causes, so this is just showing the light that's getting refracted. So it refracts once when it leaves and it would refract again going from the water droplet to the air. But what produces the rainbow is the light that enters and gets refracted once, some light is gonna get reflected. Anytime you hit a surface, some will get reflected, some will get refracted, and in fact, some will get absorbed. But the light that produces the rainbow is the light that refracts, and then it reflects off the end here, and then it refracts again while leaving. So the light that produces the rainbow that we see would be from here, going here, reflecting, and then refracting again. Can I do the bottom here? I have to get it just right. Uh, okay, you know what? I'm not gonna waste time trying to get this just right. But light entering the bottom can reflect twice, refract twice, and a double rainbow is basically, oh, maybe if I need to do it from, can I adjust this? Ah, okay. So here would be the light producing. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So. One, this is just the light that's getting refracted. But every time light hits a surface, some of it can get reflected, some of it can get refracted, some of it can get absorbed. So if I were to look at all the little reflections, it gets pretty complicated. So you've got light coming in here. Some of that light is gonna reflect off the water drop of it, some of it's gonna get refracted. Then it hits here. Some of it's gonna get refracted out, some of it's gonna get reflected. Then it hits here. Some of it's gonna get reflected, some of it's gonna get refracted out and you could keep looking at all the different reflections and refractions. Okay, so going back. Single rainbow, single reflection off the back of the water droplet caused by sunlight entering the top. Double rainbow is light that reflects twice off the water droplet and comes from sunlight entering the bottom. Okay, uh, I wanna just talk a little bit about something called the green flash. You're not gonna be quizzed on this, but very interesting phenomenon if you've ever seen it. I think I've seen it once in Santa Cruz. I know students have, but sometimes, right as the sun is setting, you can get this sort of momentary burst of green light, and we call it the green flash. So right here, green flash, right here, green flash, and it only happens under certain ideal conditions, and as the sun is setting, here's basically what happens is our atmosphere will also bend light. Because of that, one, well, let's just look at it as the sun is setting. So I wanna go through this in a second. We can see the sun after it's already below the horizon when we should not be able to see it. Meaning if this light were to just travel in a straight line, there's no way that I would see it. But because our atmosphere bends light, <coughs> we can see the sun after it's already set. And our atmosphere will bend different frequencies of light by different amounts, just because green light travels at a slightly different speed in the atmosphere than red light and so on. Well, without going into all the complicated physics of it, the white light from the sun is dispersed and we end up with blue on top sort of green near the top, and then red on the bottom. So then what happens is, as the sun is setting, <coughs> in essence, the red is cut off by the earth. Or you could think about it, the red is below our line of sight. 
blue light gets removed because of scattering, right? Our sky is blue because our atmosphere takes the blue light, absorbs it, and then re-emits it in all different directions. The only thing that's left to survive is sort of the green light. So as the sun is setting, the red light's below our line of sight. The blue light gets scattered by our atmosphere. The only thing that's left over is the green light. And if the conditions are just right, you can see this sort of beautiful momentary green flash right as the sun is setting. And let me just mention that <clears throat> I've never seen one, but under very ideal conditions, you can see what's called a blue flash, where instead of just this momentary burst of green light, you see a little bit of blue light. Okay, uh, let me go back to lecture notes. I wanna just talk a little bit about mirages. So one, I kinda went through all of this in PowerPoint, but the lecture notes kinda go through this exact same thing, a little bit more detail. Uh, did I not do, where's mirages? Okay. So one, I mentioned that our atmosphere will refract light. It will bend light coming in. And so because of that, we can see the sun when it's below the horizon when we should not see it. So let's say we're right here. Here's the sun. If light traveled in a straight line, I would not be able to see the sun once it got below a certain position. But what ends up happening is our atmosphere will bend light. And so the light from our sun gets bent. And remember, we always assume that light traveled in a straight line, which means that if we see this particular ray of light to us, it looks like it came from over here. So next time you watch a sunset, Kind of think about this. You can still see the sun after we shouldn't be able to see it if light only traveled in a straight line because that light would go over our head. But because our atmosphere bends light, we can see the sun after it's already set below the horizon. And then one more just thing about mirages. So a mirage, you probably have seen a lot of times, you'll see sort of this water on the road where it looks like there's, when it's really hot, there's water in the road. Well, that is also because of refraction and the fact that light can bend as it's going from one transparent material to another, or anytime the speed of light is slightly different. It ends up that, let's say I have a really hot day and I've got the sun beating down on the road. Well, what's gonna end up happening is the air down by the road is gonna be warmer, less dense, and the air will actually cause the light to travel slightly faster near the ground than it does higher up. So warmer air, light actually travels faster, a little bit faster. So again, if you're thinking sort of about these cartwheels, I've got these cartwheels coming in. If the light near the ground is going faster, then that means this bottom wheel is gonna be going faster while this top wheel is gonna be going slower. The end result is it's gonna cause the light to bend upwards. Now your brain does not know that light bends. And so if you see this beam of light here, to you, it looks like it came from something inside the road. And that's pretty much what's happening whenever you see a mirage. And this happens often in the desert too. So, you know, let's say you're hiking through the desert and you're over here. And it doesn't even have to be tree. It's just something that's emitting light but that light as it travels down near the hot sand is gonna get bent upwards. And you, always assuming light traveled in a straight line, you're gonna see some sort of image inside the sand. Now, why does it sort of look like water? What I think is just happening is that the light is getting bent by different amounts. You don't get this clear image. It just sort of looks like this water-like image, but it's always because of light bending 
and our brain just interpreting light as traveling in a straight line. Whoo, booyah. All right, let me stop this. Just wanna open it up real quick to see if there's any questions on anything I've covered so far about dispersion or rainbows. Questions, questions, questions I can answer. If not, we're gonna finish it off with total internal reflection. And that's sort of the last new thing that we're covering in physics 10, my God. Okay, let's do total internal reflection. So if anybody has a waterproof flashlight, this is actually a kind of cool thing to do, is if you take a bath, and you were to take your flashlight and put it underwater and then start to change the angle of it. Well, here I've got light hitting. So some of that light is going to refract as it goes from air, from water to air. Some of it is gonna reflect. Well, at a specific angle called the critical angle, all of the refracted light is gonna end up going parallel to the water. So like if you were taking a bath and you had a flashlight under the water and you got it at just the right angle, any of the light that's getting refracted would get refracted completely horizontally to the water. We call that the critical angle. Any angle bigger than that and no light at all will escape. All of the light gets reflected, none of it gets refracted. So we call that the critical angle. And this is in essence the angle at which light is totally reflected. No light at all is refracted. And let me just say it can only happen when you're going from something where the speed of light is less to something where the speed of light is greater. So meaning going from water to air, glass to air, something like that. And let me just show you on a different share here. Uh, can I use a reflection model? Let's go prisms. Get rid of this. Get rid of these reflections. All right, why can't I move? Let's get. Okay, so let me see if I can get this at just the critical angle. Okay, so one reflections. Anytime light hits a surface, some of it's gonna get reflected, some of it's gonna get refracted, some of it's going to get absorbed. Right now we're just looking at the light that's getting refracted. So the light going from air to glass gets refracted and going from glass to air gets refracted. Keep in mind, angles are always measured with respect to this thing called the normal. If this light hits at an angle bigger than what's called the critical angle, then in this case, no light at all will escape. It's called total internal reflection because no refraction at all is happening. In essence, the light is trapped inside at this point here. So if the angle's less than the critical angle, I'm gonna have some of the light refracting. But once it hits at an angle bigger than that, then you get what's called total internal reflection. And this is why diamond sparkle, can I, let me see if I have this where I can show it to you as a PowerPoint. Sorry for skimming through this real quick. Come on. Do, 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 do. Ah. Uh, open it. All right, share this. All 
uh, do this again. No, oh, come on. Okay. So if you've ever heard of fiber optics, which most of you have, a fiber optic is just a light tube. In essence, it's a tube of usually some kind of flexible glass or things like that. And the thing about fiber optics is they're designed so that anytime, whoops, anytime light hits, it's always going to hit at an angle which is bigger than the critical angle, which means the light is all going to get reflected. None of it's going to escape. So this is really great because now a lot of our telephone signals and things like that are done through fiber optics. And you can transmit a signal many, 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 many miles without losing any of the signal. And it's also why diamonds appear to sparkle. So diamonds are cut in a very specific way so that light entering the top of it is always going to hit at an angle bigger than the critical angle, which means that if I look at this little piece of light right here, this light is not going to escape here when it hits the diamond. And when it hits here, it's not going to escape. So I have light coming in the top. It gets totally internally reflected here, totally internally reflected here, and then it can escape the top. Joe, so you're, not you're not sharing the screen. Ah, thank you. Share the screen. Uh, All I see is physics 10, and it's the first slide. Ah, thank you. Uh, PowerPoint, OneNote. On that. Can you guys see this now? Yes. Total. Okay. So fiber optics is really just a long tube, usually of some sort of flexible glass or plastic material. And whenever light hits at an angle greater than the critical angle, the light will all get reflected. None of it will escape. And so you can use fiber optics to transmit signals hundreds and hundreds of miles without losing the intensity of the signal at all. So this light coming in, every time it hits, it's hitting at an angle bigger than the critical angle. So none of that light is going to get out. And like I said, diamonds are cut in a very specific pattern. So that light coming from the top of the diamond is going to constantly get totally internally reflected inside the diamond until it comes out the top. And so diamonds sparkle in essence because of total internal reflection. All right, let me just stop that. Let me just quickly see if there's anything else I wanted to make sure that I got to. Lecture notes, kind of went through critical angle, all of that. Let me mention one thing. The solutions to the chapter 28 homework. I had these in the PowerPoint. I, uh, I'll just keep them there. They are at the end of chapter 28 PowerPoint. So just to sort of help you out with this very last chapter, solutions to chapter 28 are posted at the end of the PowerPoint slide just to sort of help you out a bit. Huh. OK. Chapter 28 is done. New material for chapter or for physics 10. Done. So as a reminder, chapter 28 homework is due tomorrow. Uh, chapter 28 quiz is on oh, Saturday. And uh, somebody told me mastering physics is down right now. It should be back up, but <clears throat> if for any reason it's down in a couple hours, I'll push everything back a day just to make sure that everybody has plenty of time. Uh, questions, Brian. Um, I didn't. I did you speak? I kind of joined late. Did you speak anything about the final or? Uh, what I'm no. So the final is going to be Thursday. Uh, it's scheduled for seven a.m. Obviously, I'm not going to. Oh shit! It at seven a.m. <laughs> it's a good thing it's not live because the final is going to be seven a.m. to ten a.m. It's always the time of the physics ten finals. It's a horrible time. So what I'm gonna do is uh, it'll be available Thursday morning at 8 a.m. You'll have three hours needs to be done and completed and submitted by 11.59 p.m. I will try and make a quick little video review and I will send out a review kind of like I did for the second celebration. So within the next few days, I'll have some little review out, but it's going to be like the second celebration. My guess is it'll be 100 multiple choice questions. 
It'll be comprehensive covering everything since the beginning of the semester, but sh should be like a second celebration. It'll be open notes, open uh, everything, except no internet searches. So new material for chapter 28 is done and bring in office hours. So we are done everything for chapter 28 and for physics 10. Stick around for office hours for a while if anyone has any questions about anything that I've covered so far. Thank you all of you who've been joining me live for these Zoom lectures. It's uh, much nicer not just sitting in front of a computer by myself and just talking to the webcam. <laughs> Thank you everybody, have a wonderful day. Those of you who want to stick around, I'll hang out for a while. Let me know if you have questions about anything that we've covered so far. Um, I have a question All right, what's up, on Alan? the homework. Yes. Yeah, so I know you said you just posted the answers, but um, even when I was reading that whole section on, um, so number five about the steamy mirror and wiping away just enough to see your full face and like how tall the white, how tall will the white area yes. be compared with the vertical? I didn't understand, I didn't get that. And also like the part in the book that talked about putting a piece of paper over your head and like. Okay, let me, uh, uh, I did not, that's not a super important point. Let me okay. uh, touch on this, but uh, let me share this with you. Uh, share screen. So yeah, I didn't go through this, but it ends up that in order to see your full length in a mirror, the mirror doesn't need to be your full height. It just needs to be half of your length. So, you know, this is a little bit more mathematical if you wanted to sort of derive this. But if I have, so this is, you can see this PowerPoint, right? Yeah. Okay, so if I have a mirror, which is just from here, from A to B. If I'm, let's gonna say, be able to see my feet, then I have to have light be able to hit the mirror and then reflect to my eye. It ends up that you could work it out that even if you have a mirror, which is only half of your length, you can see your full image in the mirror that's only half of your length, just because of the way the mathematics work of angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So one thing I recommend right. people do to test this it out. Would hit halfway, kind of. Yes. So next time you take like a hot shower, let me just stop this for a second. Next time you take a hot shower where you've got the bathroom mirror all steamed up, take a quick measurement of the height of your face, cut that in half, and then only wipe away that much of the mirror. And you'll see that even in a section of the mirror that's only half the size of your head, you can see your full head. And it just cool. sort of has to do with the fact that the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. And so in a mirror that's half your size, you can always get the reflected light coming in at an angle that would reach your eye. And that's really as much as you need to know is that just in a mirror, you can usually see twice the height of the mirror inside the mirror. So if I wanted to see my full length, I would only need a mirror that's half my height, not my entire height. Okay. Other questions, Alyssa, um, Allison, more? Yeah, so what about the part that talked about like poking a hole in the piece of paper and looking through it and seeing that actually that whole section about like you were you were breaking up a lot for me last time and that whole section about like lenses and like seeing yourself upside down and oh just so you know yeah. so you're talking about the reading in the book yeah i did not cover that you're not responsible for lenses at all so oh, sorry no, thank I, god no, i'm sorry <laughs> if i wasn't specific about that no this is a really big chapter 
I was only really covering reflection, refraction from this chapter, nothing about lenses. That would take another two weeks to go through all of that. So none of the homework is on that. You don't need to worry about that at all. I mean, I'm happy to answer questions on it, but in terms of studying and thinking about this chapter and what's gonna be on it, I'm not covering lenses at all. But just real interesting, when you form a real image, real images are always upside down relative to the object. And so whenever we see the image on our retina is actually upside down and our brain actually flips it right side up. So when we see the image on our eye is actually everything's upside down and then our brain flips it over. And they've done these really cool experiments where you can give people these prism glasses which flip the image upside down before it's projected on, before it gets to your eye. And then for a while, your brain will see everything upside down until it learns and then it flips it right side up. And then when you take the glasses off, then you see everything upside down for a while until your brain goes back and does it the way it was. <laughs> Actually, is this related at all? Do you know if this is related to like when people are missing a hand but they still experience having a hand uh i mean that's called phantom pains and it's well documented and no i don't think that's related to that particular thing at all but there's a great book it's just a different way your brain throws something in maybe but not not the same oh, yeah. if you have know. like a traumatic injury uh like you lose an arm in a horrible auto accident or something your brain can sort of still, in a sense, not realize the arm is gone and still feel these phantom pains and still feel like there's an arm there. And there's actually really interesting ways that people are using to combat this is they have these systems of mirrors where, anyway, I'd have to look at it, but uh, yeah, that's a completely different thing. Yeah, that's what I was wondering because I knew about the mirrors and like looking into it and I don't know, so yeah. What they would do okay. is they would use a mirror where they would make the missing arm look like there's an arm by having their image of their other hand there. And somehow doing that starts to get the brain to realize that there's not really a hand there. I forget all the finer details, but really interesting some of the stuff they're doing with these kind of brain injuries to get people to get back to normal. Hmm. Um. Cool. Okay, so um, when the light from the sun or the moon appears as a column in the body of water, it's because the water is bouncing the light off different waves, which makes it look wavy because it's bouncing off in different directions. And so some are hitting us and some aren't. Yes. But why oh, like is it in a column? Oh, so if, so let's say that you had water that was completely flat and you're over here and you've got the sun over here. Well, one, if you're going to see the sun's reflection off the water, the light has to hit at just the right angle so that it reflects into your eye. So, you know, if I had some light, maybe if that light, oh, that's not going to do it. Ah. Uh, mm -hmm. Eraser. You know what, let me stop this for a second. Let me do this on uh, OneNote, just because it's easier for me. And let's do, 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 my rules. Okay, so. Oh, and um, I wanted to remind you also about extended time. I know I do this every time, but. I, I, I extended them as soon as I made the quiz up. Okay, thank you. So yeah, it should Sorry, be. Sorry, I just. No worries. So yeah, so let's say the sun is here and this is a calm lake, calm thing of water, and you're over here. Well, you know, the light from the sun is going in all directions and any time it hits, it's obeying the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. This light right here is not gonna hit our eye, but if the light coming in, let's say hits here, reflects and it's gonna hit just the right spot. So what'll happen is you would sort of see a clear image of the sun right at that spot there. That's if it's calm. Mm -hmm. But if instead you've got all of these little 
teeny tiny waves. And again, I'm over here and the sun is here. Well, now just because it's hitting a not flat surface. So, you know, I've got, let's say, light hitting this little wave here. Well, light could hit right here at just the right spot to make it to my eye. And then light could hit this thing at just the right spot to make it to my eye. Light could hit this wave at just the right spot to make it to my eye. So if I'm seeing these light rays reflecting off the top of the waves, what I'm gonna see is a little bit of light here, a little bit of light here, a little bit of light here, a little bit of light here. I'm gonna see it as a column because I'm just seeing the parts of the wave where the light hit at just the right angle to reflect to my eye. Mm, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's kind of cool okay. to think about just, uh, yeah, like if you've ever been to a, like a really pristine lake out in the mountains or something like that, where the water is totally smooth, you see this beautiful reflection, but then if the water is a little bit choppy or things like that, you're not gonna see that nice beautiful reflection because when the light hits the wave, it can reflect at a bunch of different angles because it's not flat. Hmm. So when it, when it hits, when light hits the water um, beyond the angle of incidence and it goes back into what you were just explaining, total refraction, total, total internal, internal reflection. reflection. So one, that can yeah. only happen in going from like water to air, glass to air. It can only happen when you're going where something where the speed of light is slower to something where the speed of light is faster. So it couldn't happen oh, okay. in going. So it has to specifically be glass to air or water or, to air, not back. Yeah, so it doesn't work the other way. So it's only if the light is going to go from something where the speed of light is slower to something where the speed of light is faster. That's the only time total internal reflection is a possibility at all. But why? I don't totally understand. Like, why uh, does it even happen? Uh, well, if this is a mathematical course, the answer is the solution for the angle gives you a nonsensical answer. But if you want to think about it not mathematically is, let me change this draw. So when light, so let's say here's, here's the normal. So let's say here's a beam of light and this is water to air. If you look at how light is going to bend, light in going from water to air is gonna bend away from the normal. So instead of traveling in a straight line, it gets bent. Well, if I start increasing the angle that it's hitting at, then what's gonna happen is that refracted light is gonna to start to get refracted more and more close to it being horizontal. The critical mm -hmm. angle is the angle at which when, so one, there's always also light being reflected that we're not drawing in each of these cases. At the critical angle, the refracted light is all refracted horizontally. So whatever angle- That's this the would part be, I'm curious. I can't give you a really good conceptual explanation for it. It kind of comes out of the mathematics. It's called Snell's law. So like if you wanted to look it up, Okay. It says some, it says basically N1 sine theta one equals N2 sine theta two, where these are the angles of incidence and refraction. N is something called the index of refraction, which depends upon the speed of light in the material. But in essence, at some point mathematically, the angle of refraction is 90 degrees, which means the angle between the normal and the refracted light is 90 degrees. If this angle gets any bigger than that, mathematically, you end up trying to take this, well, mathematically, it doesn't work. Refraction cannot happen. So any angle bigger than the critical angle, and so if this hit it bigger than a critical angle, all of that light is going to get reflected back into the water. None of it is going to escape out into the air. And so what happens with these uh, optical fibers is, you've got this sort of big light pipe, could be plastic or glass or something like that. And 
uh, draw. You've got light coming in. I kind of, I kind of get this part. Like I get that it's they do it so that it like mathematically hits, or they set it up so that it hits like those right points. Uh huh. Um, of incidences, I was just curious, mostly like what ca what is it that causes that phenomenon, like that? Oh. What you're describing to actually happen? Is it just like oh, I hit a point. I'm going to go the other way. I'm not going to go back out. Uh, but it sounds like that's, that's a hard thing. Like, I mean, it's, it's one of those ones like why does F equals MA? That's just the laws of the universe. And according to the way refraction works, beyond a certain angle, no light can get refracted. I don't know that I can give you like this is true because ABC. Whoever is it related the universe. to inertia? What's that? Is it related to inertia? No, not not that Darn I can it. think of offhand. So yeah, I see my brain is just gonna like pull out random things. And be like, <laughs> it's related to that. It's related to that. Just to like make some sort of sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I wish I could give you like the smoking gun answer, but I don't have it. Okay. All right, cool. Well, right. um, thank you. And we don't have any class on Tuesday. No, I'll probably post a little video review, but there's not going to be class at the normal time. So this is kind of like the last last Zoom lecture we'll have. Okay, well, thank you again so much. This was a really awesome class. And oh, thank um, you. And yeah, I think this is this has been great for me. I love learning. I've yeah, I've really enjoyed your class. Actually, oh, awesome. it's my favorite class this term. And um, <laughs> so, and I missed being in person a lot. I hope yeah, that um, this works out for you. Yeah, I'm like, hoping because you're an awesome teacher. Yeah, thank you. It's hard to yeah, it's hard running it online. I like the interaction in the class. I like the live lecture or the live questions and clickers and things like that so huh. yeah all right well, have well yourself you're on a roll what's that i said you're on a roll and oh. thank you again <laughs> you're welcome have a wonderful weekend and uh good luck in the final thank you all right, take you care too. Allie. bye